Um, here we go. Nicole can start. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Brianna. Um, so I will say for folks that are online, um, feel free, like the whole the good thing about Zoom and a virtual presentation is you can feel free to put a question in the chat at any time. And so I will tackle those at the end. If you have questions, feel free to just go ahead and jot them down while you're thinking of them. Um, so yes, my name is Nicole Bjornley. I am the non-game mammal biologist for Wyoming Game of Fish. Um, I often get questions on what is non-game. Um, I had one teacher ask me, is that grass? Um, I don't study grass. Uh, I work with pretty much anything that, from about the size of a wolverine down. Um, so I don't work with big game, I don't work with small game, large carnivores, fur bears, etc. Um, but it still live, leaves me about 85 different species in the state that are classified as non-game mammals. So I'm going to talk about one of those species today. Oh, I'll stay out of the way for folks here in the room. Um, these are swift fox. Swift fox are our most diminutive um, canid in the state. And so let's see if I can make this work. No, maybe not. Oh, maybe it turned off on me. I'm sorry, technology. Let's just uh, do it this way. Oh, no. oh, hold on. Bear with me. We are having some technical difficulties as usual. <laughs> okay, so I need to go to screen, right? <laughs> Okay, escape. Hold on. Why are we not going out? Um, okay. Right? Yeah, let me try again. I don't think we're screen sharing now, though. No. <sighs> Maybe try that one. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Whoa. Okay. All right. Thanks all for being patient on that one. Um, so this is a swift fox. Um, as I had said, it's a very small fox. It is our smallest dog species in North America. Um, it's about the size of a house cat and not the lasagna loving size house cat. This is like your typical small house cat, so about four to five pounds for an adult swift fox. And just for comparison with its closely related cousin, uh, red foxes, there are a few things that you can do to tell the difference. First of all is that body size. Now these are not great two scale images, but red foxes are about twice the size by weight as a swift fox. So that's one key characteristic. However, that's not always super obvious if you don't have them standing right next to each other. So a couple of things that you can use to tell apart these two species are the colors of their front legs. So red foxes have very obvious black front legs. Swift fox front legs are tan, about the same color as the rest of their body. The other really obvious characteristic is that red fox have a very bushy tail with a white tip. Um, swift fox are much more slender, don't have that really bushy tail, and they do have an obvious black tip to their tail. Now the other commonly mistaken species for swift fox, even though it might seem kind of silly, are coyotes, and especially coyote pups. So pups can be about the same size as a swift fox um, adult. And so they have some of the similar characteristics. They both have those same light colored front legs, same color as the rest of their body. They do both have black tipped tails as well. A couple of things though, if you get a good profile shot, swift fox have really obvious black spots on either side of their muzzle. They're obviously much smaller. Um, and even if we're not looking at absolute size, they're just a much more delicate looking animal. And then if you can get a good look at them head on, swift fox tend to have ears that are more widely spaced than coyotes. And I've got some good photos further on that can help you see this a little bit better. So swift fox are primarily nocturnal, although it isn't unusual to see them during the day, evening time as they hang out outside of their dens. Uh, their typical habitat is about short to mid grass prairies, and they really rely on flat or gently sloping topography. And this is because they need to be able to see around. As I've said multiple times, they're very small. Um, and so being able to watch for predators is 
a huge survival strategy for those species. They are dependent on dens and they dig these dens on their own. Um, they will use them for pup rearing, but they'll also use them year round as escape shelter, things like that. And they will use multiple dens throughout the year and they will revisit those um, as needed. So mating occurs December through February and the young are being born right about now. Um, they are gonna hang out in the den for quite a while until they start making an appearance outside. Uh, typical litter size is about four to five pups and they start dispersing about September and October. And this is really when we focus on all of our surveys because that's when we have the most possible swift box running around um, to hopefully find them more up. They are an opportunistic predator. They'll take advantage of a whole suite of things. Probably one of the most common and important food sources though is small mammals, including prairie dogs, leg morphs, um, other smaller rodents. Uh, they will consume insects um, especially kind of the slightly larger species. Um, birds, especially ground nesting birds, reptiles and amphibians if they can catch them. And just like most dog species, they will consume grass as well. Scavenging is very common. And again, another common fox trait, they will cache excess food um, under the snow so that they can consume that later as they need it. Swift fox were previously petitioned um, for listing under the Endangered Species Act. That was ultimately determined to be not warranted because there was a big concerted effort by a lot of the states within the Swift Fox range to get a better idea of how are they doing, where are they, how important and restrictive is their habitat. And what we found with that effort is actually they're a little bit less restrictive than we thought originally in the type of habitat that we use, that they will use. And they're also a little bit more widely dispersed than we thought um, when that petition went through. However, we do still classify them as a species of greatest conservation need in Wyoming. Um, and this is because the population status is thought to be stable, widely distributed. So we think we're doing pretty well, but there are some living factors that we are concerned about that could impact swift fox down the road. Um, just like most of our species, habitat loss is a big one. Human activity, primarily in the form of um, like oil and gas development, but also roadways is a major source of mortality for swift fox. And then predation, and this is predation by coyotes. So we've been working with swift fox for a little over a decade now. Um, and we have had the three major objectives for our swift fox populations and monitoring efforts. The first was to refine the distribution of the swift fox in Wyoming. Second, to assess population trend. And then finally, to evaluate some of those threats that I mentioned. And so the way that what we looked at for swift fox habitat and to define our study area is we looked for those areas that were predominantly that grassland habitat that they're really interested in. However, some previous work also showed that they seem to tolerate at least some amount of a shrub component. So we also expanded this into those more sagebrush basins as well. We were also looking for those very flat landscapes. So we limited the average slope that we could have within any one of our study sites. Um, just to try to avoid this picture that you see down at the bottom, this is just not swift fox habitat. And originally we focused our effort on the eastern two thirds of the state. Um, this is where we thought we had swift fox. So this is where we focused all of our efforts. And within that habitat, we randomly selected 100 grid cells where we set up an array of five cameras. This is kind of what each of those camera stations look like. So we had a remote camera that we staked into the ground about the height of a swift box and pointed it at a surveyor stake where we put a very lovely scent lure of, um, it smelled like skunk and fish oil and seemed to work pretty well because they're pretty curious creatures. We did all of our work, like I mentioned, in that fall dispersal period. So we've got the most number of individuals possible running around out there on the landscape and a lot of juveniles that are trying to figure out where they're going to head. Um, so there's a lot of movement going around, really trying to maximize any detections that we could of swift fox out there. And it works. Um, so here's a couple of swift fox. And even though it, the, the, how far we beat these stakes into the ground may differ, all of these stakes are about the same size. So it's a pretty good indication of the size that we're looking at. I believe these are 18 inch stakes. And so you can see these really obvious, I'm gonna use the pointer. Um, let's see here. So on that right hand picture, you can see that black tail tip. You can see those tan front legs. And then on the left hand side, 
that swift box is giving a really good um, profile photo that gives you those nice black marks on the side of this muzzle. Comparison here, swift box, or sorry, red fox. Again, look at the size of that steak. Um, this animal is just much, much larger. Um, both photos are given some great images of those black front legs. And then that one on the left especially gives a really good tail shot with the um, white tip on it. And then by comparison here, some coyotes. Um, again, kind of look at those ears, how much closer they are together. And this animal in general is just much, much bulkier. Um, and obviously much larger when we compare that to that surveyor's steak. Um, obviously not the only species we have to text while we're out there. Um, so we get all kinds of animals. Um, we've got a bobcat there that's a little bit blinded by our camera, long-tailed weasel, um, a spotted skunk, uh, magpie, um, middle row there. Those are actually four skunks in a single image. So that skunk essence um, works for those guys too. We've got um, a kangaroo rat, a porcupine. Um, we, have, we pick up lots of cottontails, lots of jackrabbits, got what looks to be a juvenile raccoon. We do get a bunch of people. We do get a lot of domestic dogs too that like to come and check it out. And then um, that cute little badger there in the bottom right. So as I mentioned, our first goal really was to refine that distribution in Wyoming. So where was Swift Fox originally uh, distributed? So you can see from this green dashed line, that's the historic distribution of swift box. Those green blobs are where we have swift box now. So you see that that has very much restricted. Um, those ones that are kind of hanging off by themselves in South Dakota and up there in that Montana uh, Canada border, um, those are actually populations that have been reintroduced from swift box and other parts of the range. So there are active reintroduction attempts to try to bring them back to some of these areas. Um, but you can see in Wyoming, it's kind of that eastern two thirds. And then within that, we kind of shrunk a little bit back from that western boundary. So when we look at how we predict swift box habitat in Wyoming, um, this is kind of what we've got. So that orange or brownish color, however, that shows up on your screen, um, that's the predicted distribution. So that's looking at where we documented swift box, where we have the best habitat. You can consider that blob to kind of be the best of the best. That black line, is kind of what we always thought was the predicted range. So not the greatest habitat um, outside of that predicted distribution, but we'd still expect them to be in those areas. However, we were finding that we were getting some really credible reports outside of this range. And so that's where our big question came in. So originally we focused on that Eastern two thirds, but in 2017, we expanded that effort statewide because we really wanted to get a better handle on where we had swift fox all around the state. And this is what we found. So each one of these um, squares represents a place where we set up that array of five cameras. The dark blue squares are areas where we captured a swift fox on camera. Those light blue squares are where we did it. And so you can see there's a lot of swift fox detections throughout this. And overall, we had over 641 photographs of swift fox. And on the 131 grid cells that we set out cameras, we detected swift fox on 40. Now the vast majority of these observations were within the distribution. So again, that best of the best habitat here shown by kind of a gray block. So out of all of those grid cells there, we detected swift fox on about 54% of cells in the distribution. When we expand that to looking within the range, but outside of that distribution. So east of that dark black line, we had eight cells where we detected swift box. So out of all the cells available in that range, um, that's about 23%. However, we have 11 grid cells that fell outside of the range. So 19% of all the grid cells outside of the range of swift box had swift box. So some big questions here on what's going on. Um, other thing that was really great, we were able to kind of look at when we were getting swift fox detections. I already told you these guys are nocturnal. This is not surprising. All of our observations were between um, about six in the evening and eight in the morning. But it's really good to be able to show this with our data because that about eight in the morning to six in the evening is when we get thousands of photos of glowing grass and cows. So we can now just turn our cameras off and save ourselves the eye strain. I'm um, gonna just really focus on that key time period. 
So that next question is, how are our soapbox doing? How, what are our trends looking like? And you bear with me, I'm gonna jump into stats just a little bit here for you. So what we use to evaluate this is we use um, an analysis that's an occupancy analysis. And so if you think of our entire study area chunked up into these grid cells where we set up cameras, we randomly selected a number of these grid cells. In this case, we picked six grid cells where we set up cameras. Set up those cameras, what we found is those blue sites had swept box, those red sites didn't. By coming back again in the future, we can see where we had those blue cells that stayed blue cells, those red cells that stayed red cells, and where we saw them flip. And so we can look at those changes over time and evaluate how our populations are doing. Are we seeing more of them flip to blue than we're seeing change to red? Are we seeing those red ones popping up on the outside, suggesting that we're kind of contracting towards the core? And so this is the analysis that we use to evaluate swift fox populations. And so we did our very first survey for swift fox, um, as I mentioned, focusing on that eastern two thirds in 2010. And again, in this case, those darker colored squares are where we detected swift fox, lighter colored squares are areas where we didn't. So from this, you can see that the vast majority of those areas where we detected swift fox are within that distribution. So we thought we'd save ourselves the trouble. When we repeated this effort again in 2013, we really focused in on that distribution because like this is where we really need to monitor trends, right? Again, darker squares representing areas that we have swift fox, lighter squares representing areas where we at least didn't get a photo of them. But as I mentioned, we kind of missed the boat on this one. We had them showing up everywhere. So again, here's that same map you saw before of our 2017 results where we've had those populations pretty much statewide. And so what we did to actually look at trends over time is we only focused in on those grid cells where we had at least two years of data. So I want to know what that change looks like. In order to do that, I'm going to need at least two years. So we kind of threw out all of those ones that just popped up for the first time in 2017 and just focused on those grid cells where we had two or three years worth of data. And again, these darker colors are areas where we ever detected a swift box. So we could have gotten it one year, two years, or three years. Lighter colored ones are areas where we didn't, and then just through in the gray cells to give you an idea of all those places that we also picked that had at least one year's worth of data. And when we look at those trends over time, it's actually pretty interesting. So from 2010 to 2013, we didn't really see much of a change. We had about 28% occupancy. So what this is telling us is that out of all of our grid cells, we'd expect to find swift box on about 28%. of them. So out of all the habitat we have available, we'd expect them to be occupying about 28%. In 2017, that value jumped to about 43%. And remember, this isn't because we increased our effort to the West. This is only those places where we were looking at swift box for at least two years. And so even within that core distribution, we were seeing a huge bump in how much of that habitat swift box were occupying. So our next step was to use all of these data and evaluate some of those threats that our swift box may be exposed to. And this is super messy. Um, only up here to show you, we looked at a lot of different things. And the thing that I'm going to focus on right now is kind of looking at what was driving our swift box populations in our 2017 analysis. And we looked at this two ways. One is occupancy. So what is driving whether or not we even have a swift box there? So we looked at a suite of variables. We looked at where is the grid cell? Is it in that distribution? Is it outside of the range? We looked at how much of the, the grid cell was flat, basically. Um, we looked at the density of oil and gas wells, looked at the presence of coyotes, um, because these are a major predator for swift fox. And we also looked at the density of roads. The other metric that we look at is detection probability. And this is, if there is a swift fox there, what's the chance it's gonna walk in front of one of our cameras? Um, usually this is kind of a nuisance variable, but the higher we can get that detectability, the more swift fox we can get to walk in front of our camera, the better we're actually gonna be able to know what that population is looking like. And so in this case, we looked at some very similar variables, density of wells, presence of coyotes, density of roads, we also threw in how much of the grid cells in express prey. This is their traditional habitat. So we thought that might have basically put them at ease and let them wander around more. We also looked at time. So if a swift fox visits a camera once and they're like, eh, I don't care. Are they less likely to come back again? 
Or if they hit it once like this is cool and they come back the next night and then the next night again. And not to spoil it for you, but all of our variables that we looked at for occupancy came out as important. And only a single variable, the density of roads, came out for um, the detection probability. So I'll walk you through what these look like. So first of all, occupancy depends on where you are. Kind of went over this already. So if you are in the best of the best habitat, there's about a 49% chance that that site is gonna be occupied. If you're outside of that, but still within what we always had considered the range boundary, there's about 34% chance we'll pick up a swift box or that a swift box will be there. Outside of that, we still have a 17% chance that swift box are going to be utilizing that habitat. So pretty cool for a place that we've never ever thought we've had swift box. We also found that occupancy was associated with the amount of flat slope. And so this is kind of backwards in the way that we think about it. But as we move right on this chart, it means that the grid cell is getting flatter. And so the flatter it was, the more likely we were to have sweat fox there. Again, this is a pretty distinguishing characteristic of sweat fox habitat, so it certainly makes sense. When we look at oil and gas wells, the vast majority of our sites didn't have oil and gas wells or had very few. But when we look at those areas where we start to get more, we see that there's a negative relationship. So the more oil and gas development and actual wells within a grid site, the less likely we were to have swift fox there. Um, and again, this kind of makes sense. There's a lot of activity. There's a lot of disturbed ground. It's just not suitable habitat anymore. And we also found that coyotes drove this pattern. So if we had a coyote show up at one of our camera sites, so we considered that area utilized by coyotes, the chance that we also had a swift fox there is about half of what it would be if we didn't have coyotes there. Again, these guys are small. They don't want to be killed. And so if they've got predators in the areas, they're hightailing it out. And then finally, we also see that the more roads that we get, the less likely it is that we'll have swift box. Um, and I will say this is all roads. So this includes those, you know, slow two tracks that may or may not ever be used all the way up to some pretty high speed um, state highways, county roads, et cetera. Now, when we look at what's driving whether or not they'll show up in front of our camera, we see that roads actually increase the potential that we'll have a swift box on a camera. This is a slightly different analysis, though. We did not include roads that were high traffic or high speed. And so this only includes those two tracks. And so what we might be going on here is that these are actually providing pathways for swift fox to walk on. And so the more pathways they have, the more willing they are to turn around and explore, and the chances of them walking in front of our cameras are much higher. So when we look at that multi-season occupancy, so when we look at those sites where we had at least two years worth of data, we see some pretty similar things. So obviously where you are in the state is important. Having some really flat land is also important. And then in this case, if you remember that chart, our occupancy shot up that last year. And so we see that there is a change over time. For detection, slightly different. So the more prairie in a grid cell, um, the more likely we are to pick up a swift box. Um, the density of roads in this case is negative, but this one is those roads that include the high speed, high traffic volume roads. And so they're less likely to move around in this case if we're throwing in a bunch of um, high speed roads. And then our detection differed depending on the year. This is really variable. There's no consistent trend in this. Um, so we would kind of consider this a nuisance. We're going to control for it, but we don't really have a good explanation for why. And then finally, if we're talking about those grid cells that are switching from blue to red, so switching from having to not having swift box, we saw the only variable important here was year and that that was negative. So basically, as time went on, you become less likely to become to make that switch from blue to red and more likely to make that switch from red to blue. So those are all our major objective for this, this effort. Um, this is a project that is ongoing. We'll be up again next fall. So what did we learn from all of this? Well, I think that one of the things we can take home is that our swift fox aren't really out of the woods. There are still threats that they have to overcome. Roads, high speed roads are a big one. And actually we get a lot of observations of swift fox that come from mortality events from vehicle collisions. It's very common. Um, 
I, I think they even like to use those ditches because it's some good ground that's already disturbed for them to dig in. And so we get lots of reports of swift fox denning on the side of the roads, even underneath those cattle grates on some of our roads that have those. So they're definitely using these areas, um, which just, it's a matter of time until they just get hit by a car, which is disappointing. Um, we do also find that coyotes are driving whether or not a swift fox is willing to hang around the site. Um, this is, again, a range-wide thing, um, just kind of the way it works. But we do know that this is also something that could be driving some of our population um, distribution. And we do know that oil and gas seems to be making some less suitable to unsuitable habitat for swift fox. So the more oil and gas we're getting out there, the more disturbance, the less likely we are to have swift fox. And when we map the oil and gas um, development over the state, we can see that there are some pretty important swift fox hotspots that are also seem to be very good for oil and gas. So this section around Campbell, Johnson County, um, that's some pretty good swift fox habitat. It's also some pretty good oil and gas habitat. So same kind of thing when we get down in Laramie County in the southeastern part of the state. Again, some pretty good swift fox habitat with some fairly decent development um, disturbance going on there. However, it isn't all negative. Our swift fox seems to be capable of exploiting new areas. These are areas where we never thought we had swift fox, even historically. So they're showing up in some new sites. And again, putting up this map that shows all of the places that we detected swift fox in any of our three years of surveys, again, with those being shown by the dark red, this isn't the whole picture. So we have numerous confirmed reports of swift fox all throughout the western part of the state. And we're basically supporting a swift fox population from border to border at this point. And so I've been working with a colleague to try to look at this in a little bit more depth. And so we tapped into a database that um, the Game and Fish has been um, contributing to and that is managed by one of our partners, the Wyoming Natural Diversity Database, and downloaded all swift fox observations that are available in this database. We're talking about over 1,400 swift fox distributions over time. And so when we model what these distributions look like, we kind of start to see this picture of what might be happening. So using all of our data up that of swift fox observations up through 1990, this is what we would predict spatially for the distribution of swift fox. And I will say some of those ones in the northern part that are really square shaped, um, that's certainly not what the distribution looks like. It's just the data's work or that model's working on fairly limited amount of data. Five years later, though, we can see that swift fox are starting to rebound a little bit. By 2000, we've got them popping up much more often, and we even have them showing up in small pockets in the western part of the state. 2005, those populations just keep going. 2010, even bigger. So we do see some stuff going on in the west, but for the most part, we're looking at recovery within the core of the swift fox range in Wyoming. I'm going to start going in two years because things get a little crazy now. So 2012, we see that population continuing to grow. All data through 2014, a little bit of a change, a um, little bit more of a change in 2016, and then bam, 2018, we have swift fox showing up in pretty much all of our sagebrush, all of our western basins, and all of that data through 2020. Um, you can see that we've kind of got them all over the place. And again, these open areas between those, those colored polygons don't mean that there's no swift fox there. Um, we just don't have any observations to model that. So they're almost certainly connected throughout each of these basins here, which is really exciting. Um, certainly some of these come from our observations of swift fox. So, you know, we're out there specifically looking for them. Um, but a lot of these come from members of the public, from other agency personnel, from other game and fish folks who see one on the side of the road, who have a remote camera set up and get a photo. Um, sometimes we have some individuals that um, are mistaken for other uh, canid species and are removed um, because people just don't know to watch for them in the western part of the state. This is something that's brand new. So I think this is really exciting. There's a lot of questions that come out of this, but I think at the end of the day, we're showing that our swift fox populations seem to be doing pretty good. And they also seem to be doing something totally new that we've never documented before. So it's pretty exciting uh, little species. 
thinking about how far it's been able to move in the last decade. Um, and I will just for folks around here highlight this Dubois area. Um, we have confirmed observations of Swiftbox on the Wind River Indian Reservation, where they've never documented Swiftbox before. Confirmed observations just outside of Crowheart. And this one up here, kind of in the mouth of the valley there, um, we don't have any photographs. Um, it's a credible source. But I will emphasize that, you know, as folks are out and about, if you see a Swiftbox, I want to know. I want to fill in these gaps. If you can get a photo, that would be even better. If you see one denning, if you see a pair together, if you see pups, being able to document reproduction is huge um, and is really only going to let us paint this picture even more. So um, with that, I will just kind of acknowledge a few things. Obviously, we've done this three years. Lots of funding sources that I kicked into this. Um, the eastern part of the state especially is very, very private. And we have a lot of landowners who put up with me every five years when I give them a call and say, hey, can we come out again? Um, and for the most part, folks love these species and they've got a lot to tell me about them. And so huge thank you to our private landowners that let us keep putting up some cameras. Um, a lot of folks that provide us access, provide assistance, whether you know in the field, logistical, with computer support, etc. So with that, I would be happy to take any questions, either from online or from the folks here in the room. I have one. Yeah. Do <clears throat> excuse me, do y'all collar any of them to track them or anything? Yeah, good question. So um, I'm not sure how well that comes through, so I'll just repeat the question. Um, we're wondering if we do any collaring or any tracking. Uh, we don't specifically do that. Um, however, there's been a lot of interest in this expansion. Um, and so we have um, some researchers out of the University of Wyoming that are going to be comparing populations in kind of that Eastern traditional habitat with that Western um, expansion habitat. And for that, they will be putting collars on individuals. They'll be looking how they're using these different habitat types, like what kind of prey they're consuming, if that differs, um, how well they're reproducing, are they actually being successful? So we haven't done a whole lot of that. Um, but it's, there's definitely more coming up. Go oh, wait yeah. a little bit. Okay, now you're on. <laughs> yes. Sorry. What, um, what drives you to put your cameras in certain areas? Mm -hmm. um, you know, like the, the ones that have been cited in Fremont County primarily in the upper country above Dubois, um, you know, that doesn't seem to be, you know, their type of landscape. Mm -hmm. So what made you decide to put some cameras up there or? Um... Yeah, so the question was how, basically, how do we choose where we're going to and not yes. going to put cameras? Um, so when we expanded this model statewide, we still kind of focused on those same sort of things. So we were looking at habitat. We didn't want, we were still looking at sagebrush. We were still looking at fairly flat areas. However, these so far, we're doing some weird things. Um, and so we didn't really restrict it too much beyond kind of those two variables. And so some of that got us into some maybe fairly unique habitat types or uh, unique areas for swim fox for sure. Um, but, you know, we've got kind of wanted an idea of what that general distribution looks like. And so some of this stuff way up the Junor. Um, I don't think we had any cameras up there. We had some, some sightings from some game and fish folks up there. Um, but we even had a swift fox that was um, captured in a martin trap um, up in the bear tooth. So they're kind of showing up in some strange places and we wanted to make sure to, to not um, miss out on that. Now, in terms of like specific camera placement, we're kind of looking for some good areas that will give us good pictures. Um, so areas that are fairly open, um, areas that, you know, swift fox are going to be willing to walk in front of. And then we put up some nice smelly lure that helps them to, uh, to come in for that as well. But yeah, we're, we're actually trying to pass a pretty broad net. So um, we were wondering, um, does the moisture... Sorry, I have a hard time hearing it online. It froze. Reset. It froze, yeah. Oh, whoops. Okay, so we heard something about moisture and now you're froze. Okay. 
I don't know if it's on your guys' in or our in. Maybe try to chat it at the bottom, maybe, if you can hear us. Sure, of a year, how much precipitation, how many inches of rain we get, the difference? Uh, I think they were asking about does um, does the amount of precipitation each year make a difference? Oh, um, in terms of whether or not we see them on camera, you know, I have not specifically looked at that. Um, but you know, this is a species. Sorry, for folks that may not have heard, the question was: Is the amount of well, at least we think the question was: Does the amount of moisture within a year make a difference, or among years? Um, and we we didn't throw that in, but. Um, I, do, I do think that's an interesting piece that, that might be a little bit complex for us to tease apart. Um, but swiftbacks are pretty, I mean, those small mammal species are pretty important and those small mammal species are very tied to vegetation on the ground and their food base. And so, um, yeah, having that good prey abundance um, is gonna be important for supporting a, a good swiftbacks abundance as well. So I do think that there is definitely that trickle up of having some good grass and good primary productivity, influencing potential prey base for swift fox, influencing swift fox populations for sure. Any other questions? Go for it. It's okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Like when they get old enough to disperse and stuff, do the young ones go far away? Do they stay relatively close as a family unit? And and like, do they hunt together or is it just everybody for themselves or whatever with grasshoppers and stuff? Yeah, so the question was kind of, how does that dispersal work among individuals and among family groups? Um, the swift fox don't, they don't disperse incredibly far. Um, that being said, we do see, we just recently last year um, provided some swift fox for a reintroduction effort back um, up at Fort Belknap in Montana. Um, and they're finding that those individuals are moving huge distances. So they're trying to find a mate, they're trying to find a place to settle down. And so I think it really depends on, you know, can they find a place that is unoccupied that's going to provide the resources that they need and come that fall, are they able to find a meat? Um, but for the most part, you know, they, they can certainly move some pretty long distances, but they aren't major long distance dispersals. And they don't like hunt in groups or anything. They're basically solitary with that. Yeah, they, they definitely, they don't pro, like, they don't develop that group dynamic the way that we'll see for like wolves or even sometimes coyotes. Um, I do think that the pair form a pretty strong, strong bond, um, but once the juveniles disperse, it's kind of, they, they kind of break up as a family unit. Although I do believe that young will continue to use some of those dens that their parents have too. I have one more dumb question. No dumb questions. What's a lagomorph? Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> um, a lagomorph are uh, rabbits. Basically. Oh. So in Wyoming, they would be our cottontails or jackrabbits, and then actually pikas are kind of a rabbit as well. So they're lagging horse, they're not rodents. But defined by incisors that never stop growing. Oh. And the behavior of eating their own food. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm out of questions. Is there any more questions for you guys online? And I can grab, um, I'll pass these around here, but just to kind of show that difference, um, which I think drives it home pretty well. We've got a swift fox here and a red fox pelt here. And it's, I mean, it's tricky to tell with pelts for sure, but you can kind of see that general difference in sizes. Um, you can see that difference in the tail. Well, this guy doesn't really have much of his white tip anymore, <laughs> but it's definitely not black, which this guy has. And then you can see those obvious black forelegs um, that are just not there on the swift fox. So some pretty <laughs> obvious characteristics that are even more obvious when they're alive and not hanging limp. But um, yeah, very different sizes, 
of these two species. So, and this is an adult. So. Tiny. Yeah. Yeah, they are small. Okay. Um, so, my name is Johanna. For those of you that don't know me, so I'm the site director here at the museum, and I guess we made it through this Zoom growing pain presentation. But all of our speaker series are sponsored by Wyoming Community Bank. And so um, they make all of this possible for us, which is great. So our next one is going to be actually with somebody from the UK who's going to be joining us. So um, that's on our calendar of events. And that's going to be another um, level of growing pains to try to figure out how to screen share with her and make it work that way. So please join us for that too. And um, I don't want to cut it off, but I did want to mention that before I forgot. So um, if anybody has more questions, please feel free to ask. I have a question. Okay, speak loudly so that we can try to hear you. Our volume is not great. <laughs> I just wondering what the future uh, plans are for the studies. Future plans for the studies. Oh, yes. So what do we have coming down the pipe for the fox? Um, there's a lot going on. Uh, for game and fish's perspective, we will be due to repeat our statewide survey effort um, that I talked about here next fall. Um, one thing that I'm hoping to do is to incorporate some genetic analysis by collecting um, scat samples. So fox, we often know that we're going to have a soap fox on camera before we check our cameras because they, they leave sign that they've been there. Um, but we can use that um, to actually look at how many individuals we have. So I'm hopeful that we'll be able to start to use this same kind of strategy to not only look at those changes in occupancy, but also get an idea of what abundance may be looking like. Um, at a statewide level, there's a lot of really cool work going on. Um, working with a researcher out of Maine, who's really interested in looking at um, getting into the nitty gritty of swift fox genetics and comparing those quote unquote traditional habitats with those novel habitats. So basically like our Eastern with our Western swift fox and see if there's something genetically that is different about them that's allowing them to exploit these new areas and be successful in these new areas. Um, another project that I mentioned is coming out of the University of Wyoming um, that's going to be really taking a hard look at the ecology of swift fox in the west and swift fox in the east. And so in that case, they will be using um, will be hollering individuals, be looking at movement patterns, um, they'll be looking at space use in terms of like how large of an area that they're using, what does the vegetation look like within these areas that they're working in, same kind of thing with collecting scat samples, but in this case to look at diet. So do we see a difference in what kind of foods they're focusing on in these two different habitat types? Also looking at reproduction. So we've definitely got them in the West. Are they doing a good job out here? They're certainly trying and we certainly see them growing, um, but do we see any differences between the East and the West in that way? Um, so lots of stuff going on it's been the next few years, um, but hopefully at the end of it all, we'll be able to have a better idea of, of how our swift fox are behaving and maybe start to tease apart some of those answers of why are they showing up in these odd places. Okay, any other questions? Okay. I guess we'll call it a night. Thanks for joining us, everybody.